Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and we praise you for your word, which is the truth. We receive your word written in our heart, written in our mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We thank you that it's establishing us in the truth and answering questions that we would have regarding this subject. We thank you and praise you for all that you accomplished through your word this night. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. As we mentioned this morning, last week, we talked about the subject of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy. A very important prophecy in regardings, we're talking about things in the end times. We see in Daniel chapter 9 that we might just bring out that ch verse 24, 25, 26, we're all talking about the Messiah and the things that Jesus did when he came in order to bring forth what God's purpose was and to bring forth the redemption. We see that when Messiah the Prince came, there were three score and two and seven weeks, which is a total of 69 weeks. 69 weeks until Messiah the Prince. And Prince means ruler. Messiah means the anointed one. When was Jesus anointed as the ruler? At his baptism. 69 weeks elapsed from the time of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem, which went forth from Artaxerxes, and this was in 458 B.C., and that brings us to, two, to 26 A.D., which is the time when Jesus was baptized and he began his ministry. Now, as we see that that has been concluded, that now that the 69 weeks have occurred, it can be concluded at the time of Messiah coming into being, into his ministry. Now, there's one week left. The teaching today has been that there's Daniel's 70th week, seven years left, seven year tribulation, God's gonna deal with the Jews, and that's gonna happen in the end. Is that true? We pointed out that that is false. And if you have never heard these, some of the things you're gonna to hear tonight, I touch, trust that you're teachable and open, and check everything out in line with the word. We pointed out the fact that after the three score weeks, then what happened? Messiah began to minister. Jesus ministered to the Jews. And how long did he minister to them? For three and a half years. What happened after three and a half years? He was cut off. Three and a half years, and what is that? That's a half of a week, isn't it? A half of seven years, a half of a week. That means that the 69 weeks that, that elapsed at the time when Messiah the Prince came on the scene, then another half week of ministry to the Jews was carried out by Jesus. So that means one half of the 70th week has already been accomplished. That means there's only one half week left. Only three and a half years left. And that's exactly what we see that Daniel's pointing out the fact that the one here, as it talks about, the one who confirms or gives strength to the covenant is the Messiah. It's not talking about the Antichrist. And he gives, he does this during one week, as we pointed out, what this literally means, one week, because it's shown in the, in the, uh, the Septuagint version. There is no word for four. It means one week. Also in Young's literal translation, we see the fact that this has been translated as one week. There is no word for four. It just means he strengthened or gave strength to a covenant, which is the new covenant, with many, which is the multitudes, one week. And that means that he's coming to the Jews to show them the covenant for the seven-year period. Three and a half years he ministered to them. After that, he was cut off in the midst of it as they crucified him. Then there's three and a half years left, and he is going to continue that ministry, will be in the time of the tribulation, which will be also the time when he continues to minister to the Jews, and they will come, the Bible says that all Israel will be saved. They will come to the place of repentance. We also pointed out that he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease, which was what? It was the offering that was continuing going on for sin by the Jews from 30 AD when Jesus died until the judgment came upon them because of their continual abominations of offering a sacrifice, an oblation for sin when Jesus was the final sacrifice for sin. It was already accomplished. So this is an abomination to God. Because of this overspreading or spreading over time, as this refers to, we pointed out, of the abominations, he's going to make it desolate. And what happened? The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was destroyed. And the Jews were destroyed. And those ones that weren't were then went off to other nations and there was absolute destruction. This was determined by God because of their rebellion and their refusal to receive Jesus Christ as who he was and they rejected him. So the point being is that there was only three and a half years left of God's dealing with the Jews and what is the length of the tribulation? 
we saw that the tribulation was three and a half years, 42 months, or 1260 days, or what's also called, not only in Daniel, but also in Revelation, times, time, and half a time, which is referring to a three-year, three-and-a-half-year period. That is important. In other words, what we're pointing out to you is there is not a seven-year tribulation period. There's a three-and-a-half-year tribulation period. The, we pointed out that the book of Revelation is a book of sevens, all kinds of sevens, but never is there mentioned a one of seven years. How do people come up with this? Because they assume that Daniel's 70th week is still to be fulfilled, but in reality, one half of it has already been fulfilled by the ministry of Jesus Christ to the Jews. So there's only three and a half years left. Now what we talked about this morning was the second coming of Jesus. And we're going to talk, just review on this, and then we're going to bring forth things about the rapture, the timing of the rapture, and also answer questions and give information regarding points that are very important to understand, as well as dealing with objections to when the time of the rapture is. We see in Matthew chapter 24, as we talked about, in verse 27, that as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man. And when we talk about the coming, this is the Greek word parousia. As you see, for those of you here for the first time in this program, we are able to put the Strong's uh, number uh, that has below here. This is the Greek word and the meaning of it and other information which is pertinent to understand what's really being said. So the second, the second coming of Jesus is the parousia, and he is going to come as the lightning. And we saw the fact that in verse 29 it says, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. Because when is Jesus going to be coming in his second coming? It's after the tribulation at the end of that. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give her light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then it says, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. We pointed out how Jesus is going to come with clouds. He's going to come with great power, come with great glory. He's going to come with all the saints. We saw scriptures about that. We saw he's going to come with all the holy angels. And he's going to come in flaming fire to bring judgment on those who have course, rejected him and on the world who has not received him. And at the same time, he's also coming to receive the church to be caught up to meet him in the air, which is very important. And we talked about how he comes in all these different ways. We talked about who he comes for. He comes for those who are the righteous ones, who are walking in line with his word, who are born again, who are hearers and doers of the word, who are not walking in unrighteousness or in lawlessness, but those who are walking in the ways of the Lord. We talked about the sign, sign of the time of His coming. And it's important that we understand that this time of when He is coming is referred to in Scripture as the last days. And these last days are certainly a time that we need to understand that they are here and they've already come upon us. And the last days is something actually that began with Jesus coming when he first came. Because the last days really refers to the New Testament era. In Hebrews chapter 1, it even says, God who at sundry times and diverse manners spake in time past unto the Father, prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Well, when did that begin? It began at the time of the New Testament. So the last days, as a general term, is talking about from the time of Jesus on, how he's spoken unto us by his Son, whom he's an appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. We see also, this is referred to over in Acts chapter 2. We talk about the last days. In verse 17, It'll come to pass in the last days, saith the Lord, I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. When was this spoken? This is spoken in Acts chapter 2 when the time when the day of Pentecost occurred and the Holy Spirit was poured out. Upon all flesh, your sons and daughters will prophesy, young men will see visions, old men will see dreams. So the last days actually began at the time of when the church age began. We see that there's many things about the last days it speaks about, and certainly we are in these last days, and we need to know that, because the second coming, of, especially in the latter part of the last days, but it, it does refer to the entire New Testament era. 
In Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2, it shall come to the pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, because what happens in the last days? We are taught the ways of the Lord. We're going to walk in his paths. We're out of Zion, which refers to the conquering church, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So we see that in these last days that there are going to be, the word of God is going to come forth. And this is important because the fact that the church has to grow up. The church cannot walk in the ways of carnality any longer. The church is going to come to the place of walking in the ways of the Lord because Jesus is going to come back for what kind of a church? In Ephesians, in chapter 5, we see over here in verse 27, he's going to come back for a glorious church, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that should be holy and without blemish. The church is to be holy and without blemish. In these last days, we see the fact that the church is going to grow up, the church is going to walk in the ways of the Lord, they're going to be obedient to the Lord, and they're going to come to the place of being holy before Him. Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And that is so important. We also see, saw a scripture over in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, over here in verse 12 and 13, where the Lord make you to increase in love, in, in, abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do unto you. To the end, He may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at or in, this really means in, it's a Greek word en, which means in, in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Otherwise, when he's coming, you're gonna be, he's gonna be, you're gonna, the heart's gonna be established unblameable in holiness in his coming. You're gonna be that way if you're going to be able to be ready for the Lord. We talked about many things that were so important for you to be ready for the Lord, to walk in holiness, to walk yeah, righteousness, to walk uprightly before Him, to be ready and be prepared, many scriptures that we looked at. At the same time, we know that there's going to be those who are going to be scoffers. Second Peter chapter 3, over here in verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, in this last days period, scoffers, walking after their own lusts. We can't be one of those who are going to walk after the lusts. It says, saying, where is the promise of His coming? Where is this promise of this parousia? They kept on thinking the fact that he's not going to come. Well, this is again the work of the enemy working in people's lives who are walking after the lusts instead of walking after the way of the word. We pointed out that if the church does not walk, the body of Christ does not walk in line with the word of God, then they are going to be candidates for the fall away. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, we saw the scripture, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. What's iniquity mean? Iniquity is a Greek word, anomia. Nomos is the root word, which means law. A is a prefix meaning not. So what it means is without law, or referring to lawlessness, as Young's brings out, because the abounding of the lawlessness. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many. And this is talking about the church. That's agape love, which comes to the body of Christ at the time of the new birth. Of many shall wax cold. Well, if they wa love is wax cold, they're in trouble. They're going to be in the fallaway crowd. We know the fact that those ones in Revelation chapter 3, as it says here in verse uh, Laodicean church, he says, the ones who, in verse 15, he says, I wish that you were cold or hot, but these guys were lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm and not cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. The lukewarm gets spewed out. It's only the ones that are hot, that are walking in his ways, that are going to be with the Lord. And certainly someone who is cold is going to be in trouble. Now we talked about the time when he comes, that we do not know the day or the hour. We saw several scriptures about that. What is that referring to? That doesn't mean we're not going to know the time. How, how can we say that? Because over in Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we saw the scripture of the times and the seasons, brethren. 
And the time is the word chronos, the general word for time. But season is talking about a fixed time, a fixed definite time, a me certain measure of time, something that is going to happen in a fixed definite time. Brethren, I, you have no need that I write unto you. Why? Because you yourselves know, or this particular word is actually in a perfect tense verb. The perfect tense in the Greek refers to past tense past tense, a past act that's been completed, completed action in the past, with present effects at the time of the speaking. So what it says that they had known at that time from the past, you have known, as Young's brings it out, perfectly, the word perfectly means exactly and accurately, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. The day of the Lord is the second coming of Jesus Christ where he is going to come. He's going to come like lightning. He's going to come suddenly. He's going to come like a thief, just suddenly. At the same time, they knew accurately and exactly that he was going to come that way. And we see also, he said, you're not to be in darkness, that the day should overtake you as a thief, the day of the Lord. We're children of light, and we're supposed to watch and be sober. He says, let us of the day put on breastplate of righteousness, faith, love, and helmet, the hope of salvation. As God has not appointed us to wrath, we're going to know about all these things. But to the obtaining of salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, or the acquiring of salvation. So we're going to know the time when he comes, as far as the general time, but we won't know the specific day or hour. We saw that, and might mention that, but we might just show you these scriptures again. In Matthew 24, where we saw in verse 42, Matthew 24, 42, he said, you know not what hour your Lord shall come. We saw in verse 44, be ready for in such an hour. Not that he didn't say that you're not going to know the time, but you're not going to know the hour as you think not the Son of Man cometh. And we also even saw that in Matthew 25, 13, it even says, watch you therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour, day or hour, whether the Son of Man is going to come. And then we saw one other scripture, again, showing to the fact that we're not talking about the time, but we're talking about the specific hour or the specific day in Mark chapter 13, in verse 35, where he says, Watch ye therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, at midnight, at the cock crowing, or in the morning. So you don't know what hour of the day or which day. Now, why is this? Because we know the time when he's going to come. How do we know the time when he's going to come? because of the feasts of the Lord. And we've talked about this in the past. There's the feasts of the Lord are in Leviticus 23, and there are seven feasts of the Lord. These feasts of the Lord are revealing, is what the revelation is, is the work of Jesus Christ in his coming. There are seven feasts. The first, there's three feast seasons. The first feast season is Passover, and that was in the first Hebrew month, which would be our time of March or April, because it's based on the movement of the moon, the lunar calendar. And at that time, Jesus came on the exact day of the Feast of Passover, on the 14th day, and was made sin on the cross. Then he bore away three days and three nights in fulfillment of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was the putting away of the sin, or the getting rid of all the leaven, which is a type of sin, and he did it during that exact time. And then, after being, being raised from the dead, in fulfillment of the Feast of First Fruits, when he went up to heaven, poured out his blood on the mercy seat in heaven, Jesus fulfilled those first three feasts, which were about him going to the cross, bearing away the sin, being resurrected, raised from the dead, and appearing before the Father, putting the blood on the mercy seat. He fulfilled those on the exact days. Fifty days later, on the day of Pentecost, then we see the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They had to wait for the day of Pentecost, for that specific day, because God does things exactly. And what happened on the day of Pentecost? The Holy Spirit was poured out. It was the birthday of the church. So the first four feasts were fulfilled on the first, first coming of Jesus on the exact day. How about after that? There's three more feasts. And what are they talking about? They're talking about the second coming of Jesus. And what are they? They are trumpets, atonement, and tabernacles. Trumpets is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. It is on the Hebrews seventh month, the first day. That is called Tishri, 
And this particular lift would be, again, on the lunar calendar, would be in either September and or October, depending upon, again, how the lunar calendar uh, falls in that particular year. So what's the first one? It's trumpets. And when is it? On the first day of the month. Now, the first day of the month is the only time when you don't know exactly when it's going to occur. Why? Because the first day of the month in the lunar calendar is when you see what? When you see the first sliver of the new moon in the sky. Now, do we know if that's at evening or at midnight or the cock crowing or morning or prior to the change of days? We don't know that. That's why the Jews have a two-day celebration of the Feast of Trumpets, because they don't want to miss the day. They don't know whether it's this day or that day. So when it says that we aren't going to know the day or the hour, it's referring to the Feast of Trumpets. We don't know exactly what day or hour, but one thing we know, that's the time when Jesus is going to come back and he is going to catch the church up into the air on the full, on Feast of Trumpets, the fulfillment of it. We just don't know the exact day or the exact hour. Then, ten days later, which will be the time of the atonement, of the fulfillment, which is the day of judgment. Atonement is the time of judgment because this is when the high priest had to go in and put the blood on the mercy seat. If he didn't do that, they'd be judged. It had to be done on that day. It couldn't be done any other day. It had to be done on a specific day because God has things exactly fulfilled on specific days. Then we see that that's going to be the time when the, um, the judgment will come on the nations, the Battle of Armageddon, they will be destroyed. And then we see five days later begins the Feast of Tabernacles, which is from the 15th day of the seventh month to the 21st day. This will be the beginning of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ where he comes to tabernacle with us. We pointed out that the beginning fulfillment of this was the birth of Jesus, because Jesus was not born on December 25th. It's a lie. He was born at the time of tabernacles as that was the time when the sheep were still in the field. The shepherds were out there in the field. They, didn't, they brought them in during the rainy season. It also was the time of the Roman tax, if you remember, from when it talks about Luke 2. And also it's the time when the, they were all there for tabernacles because it says there was no room in the inn. Why was there no room in the inn? Because all the rooms were taken. And so he was in a stable, which is like a temporary dwelling place, or a Sukkot, which is what tabernacles is all about. They would build a, separate, a temporary dwelling place, which is all pointing towards Jesus coming and being born in a temporary dwelling place. And also, of course, he came as a temporary dwelling place here before he would go back to heaven. So this is the initial fulfillment. But then when he comes back, he's going to establish the millennial reign of Jesus Christ that will happen there at the time of tabernacles. So these things are going to happen. This is why the teaching that you hear throughout the body of Christ of the imminent return of Jesus Christ is a false teaching. The teaching is he could come any time. You know, we should always be ready, of course, to, walk, to be right with the Lord because you don't know to, if you have tomorrow or not. You know, but one thing's for sure that Jesus is not coming back just at any particular time. He's coming back in fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord on the exact days, just like he has done the first four. So the imminent return is a false teaching. Unfortunately, it has gone forth widely in the body of Christ. Now, we talked about who comes back with Jesus when he comes. The saints, the holy angels, are going to be coming back with him. And we were talking about the, the rapture of the church, and this is something we want to address tonight again and also answer some important things because many people have not understood this. The prevailing teaching, the, the main teaching that you see in the body of Christ today is that, of course, they believe in the seven-year tribulation. They think prior to that, there's going to be a pre-tribulation rapture where all the Christians are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air, and they're going to be gone, and then there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period. Is this the truth? Well, you're going to find out that this is not so. First of all, if we look at the point of when the catching up of the church is, we need to look at what, a couple scriptures. First of all, let's go to 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. It says this in verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming, and this is the word parousia, which means the second coming of Jesus, referring to 
It's of the 16 of the 22 times, uh, 24 times is used, it's referring to the second coming of Jesus. In the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it says in the King James, by our gathering together unto him. And we'll comment on that in a moment. That, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter is from us that the day of Christ is at hand or that it's arrived. It hadn't. He says, let no man deceive you. Now, what are we talking about? The day of Christ when he comes back. And also, what else do we see about this? It's not only the second coming of the Lord, but it's also our gathering together unto him. What is the gathering together unto him? That's the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, what's commonly referred to as the rapture, or the catching up of the church to meet the Lord. So, notice that the coming and the gathering are all at the same time. He goes on and says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, this day of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first. What is going to happen first? There's going to be a falling away first, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. And the man of sin is going to be revealed who is who? The Antichrist, the son of perdition. Why would the Bible say, let no man deceive you by any means? Why would it take the time to warn us about being, not being deceived? Because God, knowing, of course, in his foreknowledge of the, what, how, what would happen, people were teaching things contrary to the truth. So he's warning us, don't be deceived about this, thinking that this is going to happen as men have taught. But instead, he says, this day, the day of the second coming of Jesus and the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air, is not going to come except there's first a falling away. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, there will be a falling away of the church. There's only going to be a remnant who are going to be saved. They're going to walk in his ways. And the man of sin be revealed, which is the Antichrist. What does that tell you? That means the pre-tribulation rapture is not, before he's revealed, is not going to happen. This is the false teaching that comes forth. Now let's go back to verse 1. Notice what it says. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the second coming, that's the first thing it mentions, and by our gathering together unto him. I want you to notice the word by. We pointed this out this morning, but it's important to point it out again. The word by is italicized. Notice how it's italicized. Whenever you see something italicized in the King James Version, what does that mean? That means there's no Greek word in support of it. There's no Greek word translated by there. Instead, it's been added by the translators. Now, why, have the, why did they try, add that? Because they thought that they were doing something good by throwing that in there. But you don't want to add anything. You want to translate things exactly word for word. It literally says, as Young's brings out here, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him. In other words, they're not two different things. There's not by the coming of the Lord and by our gathering unto him. There's only one thing. By the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, it's all one event. And the coming comes first. That's when Jesus comes. The catching up or the gathering together unto him comes second, which is what happens at the time when Jesus comes and catches the church up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, in discussing this matter and going over this about the uh, teaching about the rapture, we need to look at some important scriptures. And we're sharing this with you for you to have knowledge as well as so if it happens in our lifetime, we won't be deceived. And also, it's important because people need to know this because if they're not prepared and it's in our lifetime, they're going to be really blown away when they find there's no seven-year tribulation, for one, and two, there's a falling away that occurs and the Antichrist comes on the scene and they're still here. And they're thinking, what in the world is going on? Because they thought they were supposed to be out of here set, you know, before all this happened. That's the prevailing teaching. If I ask you and said, give me scriptures, give me two, the, most, the two most important clear scriptures about the fact that there is a rapture. Some people have thought there isn't even a rapture or a catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. What would you say? You certainly would say 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Those, that's what everybody will teach and everybody does teach that and it's true that this talks about the catching up of the, to the church to meet the Lord in the air. Let's read 1 Corinthians 4 or 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 15 and following. 
For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, the word remain means to be remaining over, left over, or to survive. That's because we have come through the tribulation period, as you will see. Unto the coming of the Lord, we've survived unto his coming, shall not prevent, the word prevent is a word here which means to precede. It literally means to precede. Why they translate it that way, I don't know. Young's brings it out correctly, to precede. Shall not precede them which are asleep. Who is it talking about, the ones that are asleep, the ones that have died, that dead in Christ, that have already died? And what this is talking about, the ones are going to have a new body, get a glorified body, and, and meeting the Lord in the air with this new glorified body, are going to be, first of all, the ones who are already have died, are going to get their bodies. And then the ones that are alive and remain will get theirs afterwards, which will be the church that's alive at the second coming of Jesus. Look what it says. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That means first in time. So who's the dead in Christ? All the believers who have or died in the past that are in heaven, their bodies are going to, they're going to get brand new glorified bodies first. That's going to happen first. Then it says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We're going to be caught up to meet him. And to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, what does this tell you? This tells you that the time of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air is at the same time as the dead in Christ rise, get, get their bodies. Same time. What is the dead in Christ rising and getting their body? What is that? That's the resurrection, isn't it? That's the first resurrection where we get our body. Now, the second scripture that we would look at that also talks clearly about the rapture is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51 and 52, where it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. We're all going to be changed. Something's going to happen to our bodies. are all going to be changed, including the ones that are alive. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. They're going to get a brand new body, and we shall all be changed. So what does this tell you? This again tells you that the rapture or the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air occurs when? It occurs when the resurrection of the dead in Christ occur. This brings us to an important point. When is the, resurre the first resurrection? Because we want to know right off the bat, what is the timing of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air? In Revelation chapter 20, we see in verse 5, it makes this statement. This is the first resurrection. So, this is the only place where it says this in the Word, anywhere. This is the first resurrection. So, if this is the first resurrection, then whatever it's talking about and whoever's in this company of the first resurrection, we should be able to tell the timing of when the dead in Christ are going to rise and those that are remaining are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, let's go back a verse. I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, they didn't worship the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Then it goes on and says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Now who's all the dead? The dead here it's talking about are the ones here that had been beheaded. They not worshipped the beast. They now were with the Lord up there in heaven. And who's this talking about? people who had come through the tribulation period, those who didn't worship the beast. They didn't receive his mark. So this is talking about at the end of the tribulation period, because all this happens during the tribulation period. And it says that all these ones that have come through the tribulation period, at the end, are going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead, not the righteous dead, but the unrighteous dead, they're just going to stay dead for a thousand years during the millennial reign of Christ. So they're not going to live again until it was finished. This is the first resurrection. 
So who is in the company of the first resurrection? All the people, Christians who have come through the tribulation. It shows you that the first resurrection occurs at the end of the tribulation period. Because who's including it? The people that came through the tribulation. So it's not before the tribulation. It's at the end of the tribulation. And that is an important point. Because the prevailing teaching is that it's before the tribulation, but that's false. Instead, it is at the end of the tribulation. Now, if we go back over to Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, we see something that's important. It says in verse 29, after the tribulation. That means not before, it means afterwards. This is following it. The days will be, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and you'll see all the tribes of the earth mourn. They'll see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. What's that? Remember what happens when the trumpet sounds? That's the, when they're going to catch the church up to meet the Lord in the air. And they shall gather together. This is the same phrase, gathering together, same word that we saw in 2 Thessalonians 2, where it talks about the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. Gather together who? His elect. Who's the elect? The chosen ones. Who is the church? From where? From the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. That means God's going to go take them all, the ones that are in heaven, and he's going to bring them with them. The angels are going to gather them all together at the coming of the Lord. Okay, well, that's talking about those from heaven. It doesn't show that there's anybody on earth at that time. People have assumed that they've all left and they've all gone to heaven. But we've got to look at Mark's account also. In Mark's account, in Mark 13, 24, it tells us something that's important. In those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be dark and the moon shall not give her light. The stars of heaven shall fall, the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. Then shall he send his angels, and what are they going to do? They're going to gather together, same word again, his elect, the chosen ones, from where? From the four winds from the uttermost part of the earth to the uttermost part of heaven. What does that tell you? That tells you that the elect, the ones who are going to be gathered together unto him, the rapture, the catching up of the, of the believers unto the Lord, is going to come from where? They're going to come from heaven, and they're also going to come from earth. That tells you that there are believers on earth at that time. Those are the ones who are alive and remain that are to be caught up unto the Lord. The point being that all this happens after the tribulation, so when is the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air that's going to come from all those in heaven as well as all those remain? It's after the tribulation. It's not prior to the tribulation. Another scripture that we gave that's important for you to see is in John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, down here in verse 15, he said, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou should keepest, from, keepest them from the evil. Notice, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer in John 17. He didn't say, we're going to take them out of the world. He didn't pray that. He said, we're going to keep them, guard them, take care of them from the evil. Because God will protect us in the time of this, when this happens. Now, now we've brought forth these basic scriptures that we covered before that are important for you to see that clearly show that the catching up of the church is at the end after the tribulation and we need to address some things that have been brought up by others so that you clearly understand what's being said. Many people have said, well, the church is going to be gone because of the fact that we're not going to be around for his wrath because he hasn't appointed us to wrath. We see a scripture over in 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5 and verse 9 addressing this. It says, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That is true. But the assumption has been, well, since God hasn't appointed us to wrath, that means we're not going to be here around the time of his wrath. Well, how can we conclude that? It doesn't say that we're going to be gone. First of all, whose wrath are we talking about? God's wrath. Who is God's wrath for? His enemies. Is it for his children? No. It's for the ones who have rejected him. 
that are going to be judged. So, God has not appointed us to wrath, but to the obtaining of salvation. And this word salvation means preservation or safety as well, to be preserved and safe by our Lord Jesus Christ. We must understand that when God's wrath comes, that doesn't mean that we're necessarily going to be gone from the earth. Instead, we can be protected, we can be preserved, we can be safe in the time of when his wrath is poured out. Now, remember what happened with Noah. What happened with Noah? When Noah built the ark and the time was for God's wrath to come, he went inside the ark. Did he take him out of the earth? No. He was protected. He was still in the earth, but he was in a protected place while the wrath came forth. Judgment occurred while the righteous one, Noah, and the ones who were brought into the ark, his family, while the judgment was occurring. That shows us the fact that judgment doesn't just happen just because we're all of a sudden we're gone. We can be protected in the midst of that. Now, another thing that's important is we must look at Revelation chapter 3. In Revelation chapter 3, many people have said here that Revelation 3.10, because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I'll keep thee from the hour of temptation, assuming that means we're going to be gone when the great time of temptation is going to be. Well, we've got to look at these words. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, means we've kept his word. I will keep thee. This means, again, to take care of you, to guard you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the earth to try them that dwell upon the earth. And we already saw the scripture in John 17, 15, where he says he's going to keep us from the evil. It was the same Greek word, exactly the same. Not that he's going to take us out of the world, but he's going to keep us and protect us from the evil that is going to come to pass. Another thing is over in 1 Thessalonians, in chapter 1, in verse 10, that people will say, well, God has delivered us from the wrath to come, but we're not going to be around for it. They have assumed that this scripture is teaching that. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come, meaning it's thinking it's been already done and thinking that, well, we're going to be gone from any wrath. Well, that's not what it says. When we look at the word delivered, we must realize this means also to rescue us. And this word in the Greek is in the present tense. It's a present tense participle. The present tense in the Greek means continuous ongoing action. So what it says is this, that which is delivering us or is rescuing us because it's ongoing action from the wrath to come, and the word come is also, as you see, in the present tense. You see, the way we're going to understand what's being said is we've got to look at what, it, what the Greek words are to find out exactly what's saying, because the tenses are very descriptive of what's being said. And in present tense means continuous repeated action. This is why Young's translates it, who is rescuing us from the anger that is coming. In other words, he is delivering us from the wrath that is coming. The wrath is coming, he's going, he is delivering us from that, showing the fact that it's going to be an ongoing process and we will be delivered from the wrath as it is coming forth, not, getting, not being taken out of the earth first, which is erroneous teaching. Luke chapter 21. See, the only time we're going to leave the earth is when we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air when he comes back, when he's coming back to bring forth the judgment upon the earth and then the millennial reign of Jesus. Now, many people have said, well, we're going to escape. That means that we're going to heaven. We're going to be gone. You cannot read things into scriptures to make truths or, or supposed statements without having absolute statements that are, that are verifying what a person would say. Look what it says. Watch ye therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. Counted worthy to escape. The word escape does not mean that we went to heaven. It means to be able to seek safety to be able to flee out of, to flee away, to get away from something. And so we're talking about someone getting away from something. In fact, if we look at this particular word, this particular word here, number 1628, it's used seven times, the usage of it. 
in the New Testament. Five times translated escape, two times it's translated flee. Some examples of these, because we want to see, well, did anybody uh, leave the earth and, and go to heaven when it talks about this particular word, or what is it talking about? Acts 16, 27. The keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. What does This is the word. What's it mean, fled? They just left where they were. Not that they went up to heaven or whatever, they just left, and they were fled away from the place here where, when the prison door was open. We see another place where this word is used in Acts 19, verse 16, where it says, the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overcame them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house. Same word, ek fuzo, which means, again, to seek safety, to flee out of. Otherwise, they just simply left the house. They got into a, pl a place out of the house, uh, and not that they left the, the world at all. We see another thing over in Romans, in chapter 2, where it uses this word as well. Verse 3, Thinkest thou, O man, that judges which do such things, and does the same, that you are going to escape the judgment of God? Now, what's this talking about? Remember, this is the guy who... He's uh, been judging another, and if he judges another, he, he says he's doing the same things, and he's not going to be able to escape the judgments that are going to come upon him. Well, where, when's that going to happen? It's going to happen in his life now, because if you judge, it's going to be judgments going to come upon you. You're not going to escape or get out of the judgment of God. It doesn't mean, the word never means that you're going to leave and go to heaven. We also see in 2 Corinthians, so we're showing you all these words so you can see that it does not mean to leave the earth or go to heaven. 2 Corinthians 11.33 Through a window in a basket I was let down by the wall and escaped his hands. And then I fled, got safe. I was delivered from safely from that which was trying to uh, get a hold of him, of course, to bring destruction upon him. Another place where we see it is over in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3. They shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction upon them, as travail with a woman with a child, they shall not escape. This is talking about the judgment that comes on the world. They're not going to be able to get away. Are they going to be able to escape and get away from it and go somewhere else or go up to heaven? No. They're not going to be able to get out of it. Again, this word is talking not about leaving anything, but simply getting away from something. And the other place where this word is used is over in Hebrews chapter 2 in verse 3 where it says, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? We aren't going to escape the, the effects of it, of not entering into the salvation, if we don't hearken unto his voice and do the things that he tells us to do, because we're to give the more earnest heed to the things that we've heard, and be obedient to God's word, to enter into the salvation that he has for us. So we're not going to escape or get away from, uh, we're not going to be, we're going to be accountable if we neglect this great salvation. So, what this is talking about in Luke 21 is simply that we escape, we flee out of something, not that we're leaving to go to heaven. A lot of people try to make that assumption that we're going to be going to heaven. Another thing that people have said is they try to say that the church is going to be gone in Revelation chapter 4, where in verse 1, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first, verse which I, first voice which I heard was it was as, as it were of a trump, trumpet talking with me, and said, Come up hither, and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. What many people have taught is this. They've taught that the word church is talked about in Revelation 2 and 3. And then after Revelation 3, from Revelation 4 on, that you don't see the word church, used through all the time of the judgment. And so the assumption is made that the church has already been removed. And they would say this is the time, this is all pointing towards the time of the removal. This is, what is this about? Revelation 4 is 1 is when John was caught up here to heaven, come up hither and I'll show thee things which must be hereafter. John was, reve God revealed to him the judgments that were going to come upon the world. Now, notice it says, as it were of a trumpet, not that it was a trumpet, but as it were of a trumpet talking with me. There wasn't a trumpet sound. What was it that was talking to him? A voice was talking to him. 
So this is not the trumpet, because when the rapture occurs, there will be a trumpet and a great shout. A trumpet will sound. Is this a trumpet? No. This is simply a voice, as it were a trumpet. It's simply a comparison statement. It's not a trumpet whatsoever. Furthermore, the thing that's important to understand about this is that people have made the assumption the church is gone because it does not refer to the church after Revelation 2 and 3. Well, we need to understand something. What is the book of Revelation all about? It's a book of judgment, isn't it? It's revealing the judgment that is going to come. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17, what does it say? It says, for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. In other words, the judgment that's going to come begins or starts with who? The church, the house of God. And if it first begin at us, the church, what shall be the end of them that are obey not the gospel of God? Those are the ones that have rejected the gospel. So what does this tell you? Judgment comes to the church first, then it's going to come to the world. Revelation is a book of judgment. What do we see about this, the, the judgment that's discussed first? It's Revelation 2 and 3. In Revelation 2 and 3 is talking about the judgment that is going to come on the church. Because here we see he talks about all their works, doesn't he? And what is he coming to do? He's coming to judge us for our works. And he's talking, every one of these, Revelation 2 and 3, it always starts out to each one of those letters, I know their works, I know their works, I know their works, I know their works. Always the first statement. And what is always the concluding statement with dealing with each one of these ones? The concluding statement is that whoever overcomes and conquers, will I give to eat of the tree of life or something, some blessing that they're going to have, and the one who hears is supposed to hear what the Spirit says to the churches. At the same time, he also is declaring judgments that will happen in the midst of these if they don't do what is right. <clears throat> in this case, an example where I'm going to remove your candlestick out of your place and accept you repent. He's telling them, if you don't get right, you're going to be judged. Another example is over in Revelation chapter 3, where he talks about the few names in Sardis that didn't defile their garments, walked in white with him in white, and they're worthy. And then he says, <clears throat> he that overcomes or conquers, the same will be clothed in white raiment. That's the guy who's walking right. And I'll not blot out his name of the book of life. Now, what's that speak of? That speaks of a judgment that will come on someone if they don't overcome and walk right, that their name could be blotted out of the book of life. Otherwise, he would never mention that whatsoever. And so he's pointing out the judgments that are going to come, as well as the blessings that will come. Here he talks about, if you don't watch, I'm going to come on thee as the thief, and you're not going to know what hour I'm going to come upon you. The point being is when you look at Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, it is speaking of the judgments coming on the church. We even see it with the, the Laodicean church, as we mentioned. There's the Laodicean church. I know thy works. You're neither cold or hot. Whether they are cold or hot. Because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spew you out of your mouth, out of my mouth. And he goes on and talks about here how he rebukes and chases. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. God always called him to repentance and to do the right thing, of course. And he says, how he stand at the door knocking. If they'd hear his voice and open the door, he'd come in and sup with them, and he with me. And the, force, the fact that they're to overcome. So these are speaking of the judgments that's going to come on the church if they don't hearken to his voice, as well as the blessings that will come for those that do. So the point is this. The judgment comes to the church first. So where is it dealt with in Revelation 2 and 3? Then, what's the judgment coming after that? on the world. By the end of judgment, uh, Revelation 2 and 3, the this word spoken to the church have been dealt with. So it's been accomplished. So now it, it was talking after that about the judgment that's going to come on the world. Would there be any reason to talk about the church after the church judgment has already been pronounced? No. That's why it's not mentioned after that. At the same time, who is the church made up of? When we look at any of these scriptures, just any, any scriptures. 1 Corinthians 1, talking about uh, the church at Corinth. Under the church which are at Corinth, at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. What, are, what is the church? It's a collection of people who are born again, who are members of the body of Christ. And what are we all called individually? We're all called saints, aren't we? 
Saints are those who are believers in Jesus Christ. In Revelation, do we see after chapter 4, or beginning from chapter 4 on, any mention of the saints? Yes, we do. We see it many times. In other words, the statement saying that we don't see the church mentioned is erroneous because saints are mentioned and they are the church. Revelation chapter 5, verse 8. Here it speaks about the prayers of the saints. In Revelation chapter 8, in verse 3, and in verse 4, it speaks about here with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar that was before the throne. The smoke of the incense, which came of the prayers of the saints, ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. We see also in Revelation chapter 12, people say, well, that's talking about the prayers in heaven. They've already gone into heaven thinking that that's talking about the saints' prayers of the past. Well, here's a scripture, though, that clearly shows we're not talking about someone that's in heaven. In Revelation 12, 17, the dragon was wroth with the woman and make, went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Who is who? The, the people that are born again believers. Which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who keeps the commandments of God? The believers in Jesus Christ, the saints. And who has the testimony of Jesus Christ? The ones that are born again, that have received him. So is, who's this talking about? It's talking about the church. It's talking about believers in Jesus Christ. How about in Revelation 13, verse 7? Here it says, It was given unto him, talking about the Antichrist, to make war with the saints. So he's going to fight against the saints. That means the saints are still here. They haven't left. They're still here. He's going to make war with the saints. We see down in verse 10. It says, Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Oh, it says, Whoever's led into captivity is going to go into captivity. He that kills with a sword must be killed with a sword. That's why you don't want to be killing anybody with a sword, or you're going to get killed with a sword. Whatever you put out is what's going to happen to you. But the patience, the steadfastness, and the faith of the saints is going to carry you through, and that's how you're going to make it to the end if this would happen during our lifetime. So what's this talking about? The saints. Who is that? Those are Christians. We see it again in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. And here it says, Blessed are those that die, which die in the Lord from henceforth. So, of course, who's that talking about? Believers who would die during this particular time. We see over in Revelation 16, we see this word saints is used time and time again. They've shed the blood of saints and prophets. It's given them blood to drink, for their word. This is talking about all those that are going to be killed and are going to be martyred. This could be of any time, but also including that during the tribulation period. Revelation 17, 6. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints. This is the one who kills all these martyrs, all these ones, during this time. The blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And, of course, this is talking about the, 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 the devil working through the ones that uh, martyred all these saints. Revelation 18, verse 24. In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and all that were slain upon the earth. And it's interesting also, we see about the people that are, that, are, that are spoken to be with Jesus when he comes back. Here in Revelation 19, verse 7, notice what it says. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. Well, we know that's talking about the, church, the people that are of the church, the true believers, and his wife hath made herself ready. That's the thought about the church, has made herself ready. Well, it says, To her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, that's righteousness, for the fine linen is the righteousness of what? Of the church? No, it doesn't say church. It says of the saints, because we're talking about the saints who are the believers in Jesus Christ. So what is it referring to here when it's talking about the people who are going to be coming back with Jesus? They're going to be from that marriage of the Lamb, saints. It doesn't even mention the word church, but it's all talking about the members of the church because those are the saints. And these are ones that are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so he says here also that uh, when he fell down to worship the feet of the angel, he said, See thou do it not, I'm thy fellow servant. 
and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus to worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Also, who are the ones that come back with Jesus? In Revelation 17, verse 14, notice what it says. He's going to make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. He's the Lord of lords and King of kings, and who are with him? The called. Who's that? Everybody's been called. Many are called. But also the chosen. Who are the chosen? The few. Because remember, there's going to be a falling away first. The chosen are the ones who have responded to the call and walked the walk of Jesus. And the faithful. Who are the ones that are the ones? The faithful, the ones that held fast and continued in walking in his ways. So who's going to be the ones that are going to be with the Lord? The real saints, the real church, the body of Christ, the believers, who are the called, the chosen, and the faithful. It's important to understand. Also, when we talk about in the, the time of after Jesus comes back and establishes his millennial reign, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 9, remember back, we go back up here for a moment. It says, and the thousand years are expired, Satan's going to be loosed out of his prison. What's going to happen? He's going to go out to deceive the nations that are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, to whom is the sand of the sea. So that means he's going to be deceiving these nations and gather them together. And what are they going to do? They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of, of who? The saints. What are believers referred to in the millennial reign? They're not referred to as the church. Are referred to as the saints, the holy ones. Again, and who are the saints? The believers in Jesus Christ. The point is this. In Revelation, people's contention saying that after Revelation 4, the church is not mentioned is ridiculous because of the fact that the church is made up of saints and the saints are mentioned continually throughout Revelation and they're even called saints in the time of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And further, the judgment of the church comes first. That's why it talks about to those churches in Revelation 2 and 3. And then the judgment comes to the world is why the church is not mentioned after that until we see it at the end. In Revelation 22, we do see here a, quite a statement that is also revealing. Here's the other place where it does mention about the church. He says this, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. Now, what was, what was he doing? What was he telling the churches? In Revelation 2 and 3, he was telling them, you got to do this and be right, and your works are going to be judged, and if you don't, judgment's going to come upon you. He was proclaiming the judgment that was going to come first to the church. Then after that, he's proclaiming, he's proclaiming to the churches as well what's going to happen during the, from Revelation 4 on, about the judgment that's going to come upon the world. Because what he's explaining is what is going to happen while the church is here unto the end of the tribulation. Why else would he tell the church that unless we were going to be here? And it's referring to the saints continually as we saw all those different scriptures. So the point being is that the reason why the church was not mentioned is because the judgment was already dealt with in the church in Revelation 2 and 3. So this teaching that says that Christians are not mentioned in, from that chapter 4 on is erroneous. It is people trying to hang on to some pre-tribulation rapture type of teaching, which is false. Another thing that's important is as far as the time, knowing that the time, when it's going to be, is that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 51, I want you to notice. Notice what it says. Behold, I'll show unto you a mystery. That means this is the time of the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. It's one of the mysteries. There's several kinds of mysteries. There's the mystery of the kingdom of God, the mystery of faith, mystery of all lots of different mysteries. Well, these mysteries are all revealed to us, and this is the mystery that all these things are going to come to pass. Well, there's a scripture over in Revelation that tells us that the mystery of God is finished. If the mystery of God is finished, that means it's done. Everything has been accomplished. And it says, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he began to sound, and what's this is talking about? The trumpet, the seventh trumpet from that angel. The mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. When was the mystery of God finished? When the catching up of the church 
is now they brought up to meet the Lord in the air. And when is that? It's the time of the sound, the voice of the seventh angel when he blows the seventh trumpet, which is what? That is the last trumpet. Now, another thing. People have also said, well, the church is going to be gone because the fact that they're the ones who are restraining the, from Second Thessalonians, they're the ones that have been restraining the Antichrist from coming on the scene. Have you heard that teaching? They're restraining the church from coming. The Holy Spirit, you know, and he's going to be taken out when the church leaves. Well, first of all, is the Holy Spirit been taken out? No. He's here during that time. People are going to get saved during the tribulation time, and they're going to be with the saints that are here, and they're going to be delivering the saints. The Holy Spirit is not leaving whatsoever. He's going to be here during that whole time. <clears throat> well, they say, well, it has to be the church then. The church has the one has to is the one who's holding back this Antichrist. Now, when the church is taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will be able to come on the scene, assuming that he's going to be taken away at the time of beginning of the tribulation period. Is that so? No, it's erroneous again. First of all, let's look at this in 2 Thessalonians, where it talks about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together or catching up to meet him with him. It says the day of Christ, don't, don't be shaken that this has happened. Don't let any man deceive you. The day is not going to come before the falling away first. There will be a falling away in the body of Christ. The man of sin is revealed, which is what? The Antichrist is going to come, the son of perdition. And he's the one who opposes and exalts himself against the things of God. Then we come down to verse 6, and he says, And now you know what withholdeth, or is, this means is, is holding back or restraining, is what this word means, that he might re be revealed in his time. Who's it talking about to be revealed? The Antichrist, the man of sin. Notice, by the way, in his time. The word time means a fixed, definite time. What is determined the fixed, definite times of things? God has through his word and his knowledge. He's the one. So what is withholding him from being revealed? God's timing, God's word. But there's even another thing. It goes on and says, for the mystery of iniquity does already work. Only he, now we're talking about a person, who now lets, this means to restrain or hold back, will let, until he be taken out of the way. Now the teaching has been until the church gets taken out of the way. Well, the he. Is the church called a he? No. We'll come back to this in a moment. First of all, what is the church called? We already saw what the church is called in Revelation 19, verse 7. Wife has made herself ready. What is the church referred to? Feminine. It referred to as what she called the bride. Jesus is called the bridegroom. The church is not referred to in the masculine. It is referred to in the feminine. Therefore, when it's talking about the he, it is not talking about the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit's not leaving, and it's not talking about the church, because the church is a she. So who is it talking about when it says, till he be taken out of the way? We know it's according to God's time when the, uh, the Antichrist will be revealed, which would be according to his word, and God's in control of it. But who carries out God's word? Who's the one that carries out all of his things that go on? The angels do. And who is the one who holds things back? Angels do. The he that he's been, the he be taken out of the way would be the angel that's holding back the Antichrist from being able to manifest. Example of some scriptures to even show how angels hold things back. They do all of his work in the earth. They carry it out. Revelation 7.1. After these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth. They're holding the four, they're holding this back. The four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth. Who does the holding back of the winds? The angels do. We see it's the angels that carry out God's work in the earth. They're his servants that minister uh, and carry things out for him. Revelation 9, 14, saying to the sixth angel which had the trumpet, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Otherwise, they were bound and now they're going to loose or untie the four angels. Who's going to do that? 
The angels are going to do it. The angels kept them bound, and now the angels are going to untie them. The point being is, who is doing the restraining? It's the angel of God, to carrying out according to God's word and according to his timing when the Antichrist will be revealed. See, people have said, well, it was the church as their reasoning being, well, the church goes out of the way, now the Antichrist can come on the scene. We're not here when the Antichrist is here. We've got to, he got to take us out of the way before he can come. It's a lie. It's not the truth whatsoever. The church is still here. The saints are still here. What is holding them back is an angel. In fact, think about it in Scripture. Examples, even further, about what angels do. Aren't the angels, if you do a study on angels, you see the angels are doing all these mighty works for the Lord. Example, Exodus 14, 19. Angel of God, which went before the camp, camp of Israel, removed and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. The angel was holding up this pillar of cloud, where it was darkness to the Egyptians, and yet there was light towards the, the Israelites. It was the angel that was doing these things. Who is the one that shut the, the, the mouth of the lion? Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22. We know who it was. My God has sent his angel that shut the lion's mouth. Angels carry out everything for God. They're the ones that do his works. So who's holding back the restraining? God's time clock and the angels. Hardly anybody teaches this. They always teach it's either the church or the Holy Spirit doing it and he's going to leave, which is erroneous. The Holy Spirit is not leaving. He's still here. He's going to carry everything out. He's the one that's here. He's, that's God. He's not, not leaving whatsoever. And the church is not able to hold them back whatsoever. So we see these kind of things that are taught, which are incorrect. And unfortunately, the main things that you see is people say, well, the church is not there after Revelation 4. But yes, they are all the saints, that they're the ones that are holding them back. No, they're not. They're not holding them back. It's God's time clock because of his word and the angels who are holding them back. They make the assumption that they we're leaving before the seven-year period. Of course, it's not a seven-year period. It's a three-and-a-half-year period. And also, they assume that we're not going to be around for the time of the Antichrist when he shows up on the scene, which, as we've already seen, is not so. Because as we pointed out, that is the scripture clearly says, don't let anybody deceive you. The day of the coming of the Lord and our gathering to him, it will not come until the falling away first and the man of sin is revealed. So we know it's the man of sin will be revealed. So again, this is all false teaching that has come forth. And the fact that many people have not understood the feast of the Lord has really given rise to the deceptive teaching that the imminent return of Jesus, he can come any time. Everybody teaches that out there almost. And yet we already know that's not going to happen because he's going to come at the time of the fulfillment of the Feast of the Lord, which is the Feast of Trumpets. And then the Fall Feast will be fulfilled. Jesus will come on, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know it's going to be on the Feast of Trumpets and we're going to be ready and it's all going to happen. Furthermore, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, how long does he have? He has 1,260 days. He has three and a half years. He's got 42 months, and it's going to happen. We're going to be able to count down to that time. We're just not going to know the exact day or hour, but we're going to know when he comes on the scene. And how are we going to know when he comes on the scene? Because the Bible talks about the fact that, remember that there's going to be 10 nations, ten, this 10 uh, confederacy of nations or uh, groups that are going to be ruling. And it talks about that the Antichrist is going to rise up among them. He's going to overcome these two. And then of the remaining seven, it says the seven are going to give their power, which means authority, to the beast. And so what's going to happen? They're all, he's going to transfer his authority. Now, what does that mean? And you must understand, you think, well, maybe this will be a long time off. Now, you've got to understand the vehicle for this is already in place. The reason we know this is because the EU, which is the European Union, which is the establishment of all these nations that are now in the members of, the, of this group, that what they have is they have a revolving presidency. And each one of them has the presidency of the EU for a six-month period. 
one particular nation rules for six month period, the period, then the next one passes the, to a next nation for six month period to the next nation. So it's already set in place. This has already been established when the EU came into being, which was in January of 1993. This thing came into being way back when they established it. It didn't get, you know, it's been going little by little, evolving, but that's when they set everything back in place. So we see now that this being in place, what does that mean? If you take seven of these nations that are left times six, what is that? 42. 42 months. These are going to give their authority into the hand of the beast when he comes into operation, and everybody's going to be able to see it clearly. I'm talking about people that are Christians that have revelation. The world out there that doesn't understand it, they're going to fall for this, and the people that are walking in lukewarmness they're going to be, are going to fall away. They're going to end up being deceived, and the, the, unfortunately they'll probably end up taking the mark, and they're going to be in trouble. But those who want understanding the fact that 42 months from the time that he is given authority for 42 months, the clock is ticking. He's got 42 months, and you better believe it's going to happen the three and a half years before the time of the judgment. Now, you say, when could that be? Well, first of all, when's the judgment? The judgment is on the Day of Atonement, because that's the tenth day of the seventh Hebrew month, which is the time of judgment. That's the time when the nations are going to be judged. That'll be the fulfillment of that, the Battle of Armageddon, they're going to be destroyed. So if he has 42 months, you go back 42 months from that time. What's going to happen? We go back three full years, now we have six more months. If we go from the seventh Hebrew month, the tenth day, back six months, where does that bring us to? The first Hebrew month, the tenth day, right? From the seventh Hebrew month, tenth day, you go back six months, you come back to the first Hebrew month, tenth day. What happened on the first month and the tenth day? That's the day, if you remember, when they had to bring in the Lamb to present Him in Revelation or Exodus chapter 12. We see here in verse, uh, um, it was back in verse uh, 3. Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, the first day of the first month, you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. This is when the lamb was presented on the tenth day of the first month. Well, what did Jesus do? Jesus presented himself on the tenth day of the first month as the lamb of God that was going to take away the sin of the world. He was examined for those four days before he was crucified on the 14th day. So what is Satan going to be, this, this uh, man of sin, the Antichrist? He's a counterfeit, and he's going to declare that he is God. And he's going to show up and begin his rule at this time on the 10th day of the first month. And he's going to proclaim that he is the real fulfillment of what this thing is all about. But he's a liar, and he's a deceiver. Satan has always been one to deceive, and the Antichrist will try to deceive the world. He's going to declare that he's God. And of course, unfortunately, people are going to not believe in Jesus, and then God is going to, you know, because they have rejected Jesus, they'll believe a lie. God's going to bring a strong delusion upon them, as it says in 2 Thessalonians. They're going to believe a lie, and they're going to end up following after him and believing that he is God amazingly. But that's what's going to happen. You think, how could that happen? Look at the deception out there of all the way things are in the world already. It's going to get a whole lot worse. You better believe that this is going to happen. The falling away happens. People are not going to be, they're going to be in the candidate to be in the camp with the Antichrist and this, this false leader who is going to come. So he's going to show up, he's going to take over, and he's going to say, I'm the true God. And of course, at the same time, You've got to realize there's going to be lying signs and wonders that are going to come forth. In fact, we've got to be sure that we don't follow after anything. You know, many people today in the Christian world, what do you see they do? They seem to flock to people that have signs and wonders and gifts, don't they? And they just run after them. Anytime anybody's had any, uh, you know, uh, signs or wonders or whatever, they just seem to flock right after them. Well. That's a mistake. The Bible talks about how the false prophets are going to arise. And we see the fact that they're going to arise. We come down to verse uh, 
uh, 21, how the great tribulation is going to come. It says it's not going to be, it's, it's worse since the beginning of the world to this time, no shall ever be. And it says, except those days will be shortened, no flesh will be safe, but for the elect's sake, the days will be shortened. That's for the, that's for the church. And uh, talks about there'll be rising false Christs and false prophets shall show great signs and wonders. I mean, these signs and wonders are going to be great, marvelous, miraculous signs and wonders. Satan can do those kind of things, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's why it's critical that if this happens in our lifetime, you never follow after signs or wonders. If you follow after signs or wonders, you are going to be in trouble. You always follow after Jesus and the Word of God. But this is how they're going to be trapped. People are going to follow after the great signs. That's how so many are going to be led astray because they're going to see the signs and wonders and think, this person must be something that's of God. That's the same thing that happened in the Lakeland Revival that happened a few years back. If you're aware of the fact that someone was doing these signs and wonders, but they weren't of the Lord, they were, they were lying wonders, a lot of people's so-called so healings did not uh, continue. They left and they had all kinds of problems. And the person who was supposedly conducting this revival, who was acclaimed by all these so-called major prophets and apostles and people who think that they are they, they, in the body of Christ that have thought that they were hearing from God and they proclaimed that this guy was the leader of this great revival that was coming. The man was committing adultery with another woman. He ended up divorcing his wife and he married this woman. The whole thing came out, the whole thing was destroyed and came down to nothing. Was this right? No. Was this an example of pe people being deceived by false prophets? You better believe it. And was this an example of the whole body of Christ? Because people came from all over the country and all over nations, all over the world. The one particular network broadcast all of their services all over the world to millions, hundreds of millions of people. What deception was going forth? And the whole thing was a lie. It was all false. You think it can't happen again? It happened even in our lifetime. It's going to happen because there'll be false Christ and they're going to do great signs and wonders to try to deceive the elect. That's why you must not allow this to get a hold of you. He says, I've told you before, he's warned us. So what do we see? We've seen, we pointed out and kind of covered, went over some of these things that people have said to justify a pre-tribulation rapture. Would we all like to see a pre-tribulation rapture and get out of here before all the evil? You better believe it. But unfortunately, it's not in the word. So you can't believe something that's not the truth. The truth is, the second coming of Jesus Christ is going to come in fulfillment of the feast of the Lord, the fall feast. On the, day of Pen on the day of trumpets, the catching up of the church, we don't know the day or the hour, but we know the time. And we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air at the end of the tribulation, which is the first resurrection. And then we're going to be with the Lord. And then 10 days later, the judgment will come which is the fulfillment of the Day of Atonement. And then five days later, it will begin the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, where he's going to begin to rule and reign, and we're going to get our rewards, and you and I are going to be in that camp. And we're going to be with him. In a thousand years after that is loosed, then the, 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 the bow ended. Satan, who had been bound for that time, is going to be loosed. He's going to go out to deceive the nations. And what's going to happen? Of course, He's going to rise up to try to come against the camp of the saints, but God's fire is going to fall from heaven and devour them, and they're going to be destroyed. And then the white throne judgment will come, and then the judgment will come upon all those that have been dead for that thousand years are going to be now brought to life, and they're going to be all judged according to their works. And if they're not in the Lamb's Book of Life, they're going to be tossed into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already have been thrown into. And all these ones are going to be in eternal torment forever. And then what's going to happen? After all that, then there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. The new Jerusalem is going to come down from, from above. And we see now that God is going to come. The Father is going to come. And he's going to tabernacle with us. Praise God. New heaven and new earth. First heaven and first earth are passed away. There's not going to be any more sea. No sea in this new heaven and new earth. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. 
prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We're going to be living in a new city, a new place. And he says, the tabernacle of God's with men. He's going to dwell with them, and he shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them. During the millennial reign, the Father's remaining up in heaven. But during the time of the new heavens and new earth, the Father's going to be dwelling with us. We're all going to be together. Jesus will be here ruling during the millennial reign, but this will be the time when the Father comes. No more tears, no more death, sorrow, crying, pain. All these things will be passed away. And so we're going to have a glorious time in eternity with the Father and with Jesus and with the fellow saints that have followed the Lord. So we see this understanding. It's so important because if people don't understand this, what's going to happen? When all this stuff starts coming down and they say, well, I thought there was supposed to be some seven-year tribulation and when not happening. And all of a sudden, the falling away occurs. What's going on here? I thought we're supposed to be out of here. And then we see the Antichrist comes on the scene, and that's really going to blow the people away because they thought they were supposed to be long gone out of here. And in fact, they're not. Instead, now we've got the 1260 days, 42 months, time times half a time, the clock is beginning to run. And then it's going to be persecution like the world has never seen because all these demons are down here. They've been this war in heaven where Michael and his angels fought against the devil and they were cast out of the heavens and they're no more there in heaven. Now they're cast down to earth, as the Bible says, and they're, they're going to have great wrath knowing they have a short time, 1260 days, boys, until you're going to be done. And then that's when Satan, of course, is, they're going to be defeated and Satan's going to be cast into that pit for a thousand years and he's not going to be able to do anything during that time. So the battle, the war is going to be on during that time. But if we're not, if people are not prepared for that, it's, they're not going to be ready. And of course, those ones are going to be in trouble. And there'll be a lot of people will be martyred instead of being victorious. And uh, it's not wrong to be martyred as long as you don't deny the Lord at the same time. The best thing would be to be protected, be made, kept safe, make it through to the end if it happens in our lifetime. And certainly, we're certainly fast approaching this time because we know the end times are here. The vehicle even is set for this ten-nation confederacy. And the whole we see what's happened in the world. Isn't it amazing how the world in the last, let's say, 20 years has gotten so much worse? 20 years ago, homosexual was not accepted. 20 years ago, you didn't see all this, the things that you see going on today. And yet, what's it going to be like? It's getting worse and worse. And we know that homosexual is going to be rampant because it's going to be just like in the days of Lot when homosexual was rampant. And see, what do you see happening? Nation after nation is accepting this. And the United States is even behind this, pushing all these nations in Africa, trying to get them to accept the homosexual agenda or holding, holding back their aid. What's going on right now? That's why we've got to continually pray for God to turn this nation around. Otherwise, it's going to be in trouble. But praise God. We're going to serve the Lord. We're going to walk His way. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to be obedient. We're going to be one of the called, the chosen, and the faithful. And we're going to see the second coming of Jesus. If we are still here, we want to be one of those that are alive and remain to be caught up with the Lord, to meet Him in the air on trumpets. We don't know the day or the hour, but we're going to know the time, and we're going to be ready for Him if we are here at that time to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Say this to me, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word that brings revelation of the second coming of Jesus and the catching up of the church to meet the Lord in the air. I thank you that I will not be deceived. I see the truth and I will be prepared. If it's in my lifetime that I will be ready to go through the things that are coming on the earth. But if I am keeping your word, you will keep me and protect me from the evil. And I thank you that I can be one of the ones who will be alive and remain surviving unto the coming of the Lord, to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And I also know that I'm going to be judged at the end of that time according to my works. I'm going to follow Jesus and do everything that I'm expected to do. I will work out my own salvation. 
I will carry out the ministry and do the work of the Lord because I'm going to be rewarded according to my works. And then I'm going to have my place in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And I'm looking forward to the second coming of Jesus. And then the time when the Father will come and there'll be a new Jerusalem, a new heavens and earth, and I will fellowship and abide with the Father and with Jesus throughout eternity. Thank you, Father, for this revelation. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, I trust this has helped you this evening, especially about answering some questions or points that people have brought up about the fact that I'm thinking the church is going to be out of here because of Revelation 4.1 or the church is not mentioned when it is. All the saints are mentioned or all these different things that we brought up. Again, it's amazing that people out there have taken hold of the teachings that they have when there's no scriptural basis for it whatsoever.